Okay, thank you. First of all, thanks very much for inviting us to present. And uh, thanks to Peja and his team for all the hard work in analyzing the data. It's going to be really useful for us. I want to mention all the people in the team first. Ian and uh, Nicola uh, generated all the functional family information that we use, this domain family information we use. They also um, had their own cascade model, I'll explain later. Um, Harry included network data with the, the functional family information. And um, the person I want to concentrate on really for this talk, because we were asked to talk about FunFams 3, um, is, is John Lees, who was a researcher in my group until a couple of years ago, uh, moved to Oxford and has collaborated with us um, using the functional family data. And I'll explain as I go through the talk. First of all, just to remind you how useful domain information is, and we've known for a long time that, that domains have a functional signal, although they can be combined in different ways. Um, usually the, the role of the, of the domain is conserved. Here you can see one binding to the vehicle, the other important for the, for the motion. Uh, and what we've done for more than 20 years now is to bring domains together into evolutionary superfamilies. Um, we do that using structural information to begin with. Um, and then once we have the structures classified, we take the sequence information from them and build patterns of conservation, which, which actually we use as hidden Markov models. Um, the challenge we have is, is uh, the fact that, as you've heard of many talks actually during this conference, is that you get divergence of function. And a very nice talk from uh, Matthew Hearn yesterday, where whether this is orthologs or paralogs, it's still a challenge that we have in function prediction. Um, and so we've developed algorithms that allow us to segregate the different functional groupings purely using sequence data. So that's all we use. We don't use any experimental information or any other information. It's, it's just sequence data. Um, and the, the idea really is to recognize different um, functional determining residues in different groups of proteins. I'm not going to a lot of detail because Nicola Bordan talked about this yesterday, but just to remind you that um, we segregate these groups by using um, multiple sequence alignments and looking for patterns that distinguish them. So in other words, where we can see positions that are differentially conserved. And it's these differentially conserved positions that are important for function. Um, the other positions tend to be important for stability and, and folding. Um, and this fun family algorithm has been used to generate our functional families um, in CATH. Um, what's nice is that it, it just only needs sequence information. It generates a hidden Markov model pattern, if you like, for each functional family, which we can use for CAFA function prediction. And obviously it, it gets more powerful the more sequence data we have, because obviously these patterns become clearer and it's easier for us to segregate the functional groups. Um, I should also make it clear that each fun functional family has at least one experimentally characterized relative. And that means that we don't build functional families for all the sequences in CAS, because we want this to be functional families really to be about precision. Um, we just build them at the moment for where we have at least one experimental relative, which somewhat restricts the method in terms of coverage. And I'll come back to that. One key thing is to keep this up to date with all the sequence information and that's challenging. So the big, uh, the big improvement for us really since CAFA 3 is, has been a sort of doubling of the information. And as you can see, actually nearly a trebling of the functional family information. So that was a huge task, thanks to Nico Bordon and Ian Silito for getting that done. Um, uh, the other thing that we've done is to improve the accuracy with which we map sequences into our families. I'm not going to go into too much detail about this because it's published, but it's um, uh, an optimization algorithm that uh, with a query sequence, we work out where the different domain families lie and we optimize by looking for the maximum sum of head score. We've also optimized the algorithm. And again, I'm not going to go into detail because Nico talked about this yesterday, but we know that um, for the most massive and the most functionally diverse superfamilies, many of the domains will appear in different multi-domain contexts. And we know that that can often modify the function somewhat. So we partition these large superfamilies into different multi-domain partitions. And that allows us to speed up the algorithm uh, massively, actually. We go from six months to six weeks, which meant that we could get all the data ready for CAFA 4. Um, but also it improves the, it seems to improve the accuracy as well by our benchmarking. We use a, a rollback here and you can see, actually, sorry about the scales here, the axes, but um, I think again, Nico talked about this yesterday, um, if you want more information. 
but we could see improvement in the functional purity, the accuracy with which this, this was working. So we built um, two, two, over 200,000 fond farms for, uh, to be ready for cattle poor. However, we're somewhat limited still in coverage in that not only do we have to have an experimental term for each functional family, but we have to have a structure uh, for the super family. And so to in improve the power or increase the power, we also brought in domains from a, re a really wonderful resource that was set up by Alex Bateman. I'm sure you're all familiar with it, um, PFAM, and it's also been managed by Rob Finn more recently. And we applied FunFama to that, and that increased our functional family library. Um, but as I mentioned, we still have this restriction that we have to have experimental information associated with each functional family, and that always re uh, reduces our coverage for CAFA. Um, and so we, just to explain the models that we tried, and, um, we use some sort of classical bioinformatics, so not, not really machine learning. We're using our hidden Markov models, and we use this cascade approach whereby we try to assign to uh, a CAS fund fund first, just because of, uh, we've done a lot of work on the domain boundaries, if we don't get a hit, then we go to PFAM from farm. And this is our high precision model. To expand the coverage, we also bring in um, the uh, additional, so this is sort of non-redundant information. This is expanded information. And we also look for hits in PFAM or CAF. Um, however, we're still somewhat restricted in coverage. So we explored bringing in other domain data. And as um, you heard in the previous talk, um, the there are, or, other very good resources in Interpro. So um, the method that, that you saw shown in Peja's slides is this, this third method, which expanded our functional family information with more domain information, and also used a machine learning um, method to integrate the data. So we used Interpro, which uh, you've heard a lot about in the previous talk, um, uh, managed by Rob Finn at the EBI. And we obviously we have Cass and PFAM function associated families already in our method, but this meant we could bring in other, uh, some of which are very nicely curated resources, HAMAP, TigerFAM, Prince ProSite, they're, they're all um, uh, very good resources. Actually, I've missed some, but I'm sure you're familiar with, with many of them. And we used the same strategy. We just took the best family match that we got, and we calculated probability for that go term, reflecting the frequency within the family. We also used Uniprot just to make sure that we didn't miss anything. And we used the Uniref 50 cluster. So this is maintained by Maria Martin at EBI. And we think 50% is, is quite a good threshold. Actually, um, benchmarking we've done, and actually Burkhard Ross before us has shown that uh, 60, 60 or 70% is a bit safer, but 50% uh, is reasonable. So the question was how to add this information. So when we used our simple cascade model, we could see that this extra data wasn't, um, was adding a, a little bit of uh, increasing the performance a little bit, sometimes a bit ambiguous. And in other cases, we obviously weren't handling this data well. And some of it was because the thresholds for these families have been set to detect um, homology, but not necessarily functional similarity. And so um, this is where we decided to use a machine learning method. And this is where, I mean, John Lees used this method uh, three years ago for, for, for CAFA 3. Um, and this time we, I guess the only, the main changes are that we had a lot more functional family information and we thought it was much more accurate, more pure. Um, the rest of it is the same, apart from the fact that John switched from um, a random forest to XGBoost. And this, this seemed to be very well suited to the application. It's got a, a, new, a, a way of, uh, adjusting for the, um, the, the errors of prior models um, by adding, adding in new models. It's quite easy to train. Um, there aren't too many parameters. I'm just only showing a couple of them here. Um, and the, the way, therefore, we used it was to bring together the predictions that we had from our different domain um, resources. So the CAF one, the PFAM, FOMFAMs, uh, what the best interpro match, whichever cluster, UNIREF cluster, we did add a few other features, some sensible things like how long the protein was. If it's too long, then its function might have been shifted because it's got a lot of additional domains. Um, what we found was very important was how we trained it um, in terms of making sure that we had plenty of difficult cases. I should say that this was uh, all this work was sort of done um, three weeks before the deadline. And actually, this XG boost part of it was possibly more like a week before the deadline. So I don't have a lot of benchmarking results to show you, and I'm really sorry about that. I just have this one slide 
that suggested that as we brought in the Interpro information, we certainly got uh, an, an improvement in the performance. Um, and so I think I just want to sort of summarize by saying uh, the, I think the, uh, I'm grateful I had a, was given a chance to talk because I think it just shows that with using the purely sequence data and particularly these domain family resources and you've heard Interpro mentioned, we use a functional family information um, you can you can get quite a, a long way. I think the other advantage of using these resources is they provide other annotation as well. So once you have the functional prediction, um, you can also go to the families and get more information. So uh, we provide information for, on structure predictions as well, because we can see that within the functional family, because the form, if you like, is constrained by the function, the relatives are really structurally well conserved. And you can see in this particular example, quite often you get conservation of the substrate binding mode, or in this case, the drug binding mode. So you can use this data for drug repurposing, but also perhaps more, even more useful because there's hardly any functional site, experimental functional site data, is that you can use these domain families, um, PFAM as well, to look for highly conserved positions that if you have structure, you can project onto the, onto the, to the structure and see where the functional sites are. And I just wanted to mention this because we also have used XGBoost recently to disentangle um, different types of conserved residues, um, catalytic from uh, ligand binding from interface residues. So I just want to end by saying our method is rapid and it can be run purely on the sequence data. It's powered mainly by these evolutionary functional signatures and these will become stronger as more and more data is brought in. And at currently, with our functional families, they, they capture about 40% of the, the sequences in CAS, but they still allowed in, in, allow inheritance of quite a lot of functional information from about a quarter of a million to, to nearly 35 million. And, and the other thing to point out is the resources I've mentioned today, um, CAS and PFAM and Interpro and Uniprot are all part of the sort of elixir repertoire of, of um, protein family information. So I want to end by thanking the people who contributed. Um, so uh, I'll just mention Ian and Nicola to begin with, who generated all the functional family data in sort of rapid time, in time for CAFA 4. Um, Harry, I, I didn't have a chance to talk about his work. I want to thank Natalie because she helped, uh, has done a lot of work on CAF, expanding CAF and managing the updates. And finally, um, the important person to thank is, is John, for uh, applying this XG boost algorithm, which was a good way of finding out how and when we could safely use some of the other domain resources. And, and these other domain resources I'm acknowledging too on this slide. So thanks very much, and I hope I've not gone over too much. Thank you, that was a great talk. And um, yeah, we have quite a few minutes for questions. Um, so let's see, the first one we've got when training XGBoost, do you formulate the problem as a binary classification problem or as a learning to rank problem? Um, I think it's a, a binary classification. Actually, I, one thing I didn't say, which I should have said, was that I really wanted John to give this talk. But unfortunately, because we didn't really think that our methods would do particularly well this year because we thought that the network and tax mining data would outperform, he, he booked his holiday so he's actually in a tent somewhere in Devon at the moment. So I know I'm not going to be able to answer all the, um, all the questions about XG boost as well as I would like. Um, I, as far as I remember, it's a binary classification. Okay, thank you. Um, next question. Great talk. How did you choose between using Interpro versus Genome 3D? Thanks. Um, Genome 3D are structure predictions. So we didn't use Genome 3D at, at all, but that might be something for the future that um, the previous speaker could perhaps bring that sort of information in. We only used our sequence data. So we only used um, our functional family information where we're sort of, we are predicting assignment to a structural superfamily, if you like, but we're predicting assignment to the functional grouping within that superfamily. So it's purely sequence driven. We're not, we're not trying to predict any structural features. All right, uh, next question. Do you have the automatic homology model pipeline ready for CAF family members? Uh, well, we, we have a, a, do you mean homology modeling as in the sense of structure prediction? We do, we do have a homology modeling pipeline that we use for genome 3D. And we have um, already built 
models for structural models for a number of um, model organisms. But that's not really related to this talk. For this talk, we do have a server that allows people to search against CAF and find out what functional family, what sequence family within CAF their protein belongs to. Hopefully that covers that question. Yep. Um, okay. How difficult would it be to apply the algorithm to a totally different set of annotations? Um, it should be very straightforward, actually. Uh, we, we, I mean, um, we, we use what we thought were the most um, accurate, if you like, uh, uh, functional families. So that's, that was our own because we've explicitly classified them for function. However, the curated resources within Interpro that I mentioned um, some of those have, have been uh, probably some thought about function has gone into the grouping of those sequences as well. But you could use any, um, you could use any uh, domain family resource that you wanted to with this method. We just simply look to see which family has been matched um, and what the score of that match is or what the probability is. And then the algorithm is really sort of learning what are the distributions of probabilities that make for a good, a good go prediction. Okay, oh, we have another question coming in. Um, do you train one XG boost model for each Go term or one model for all the Go terms? Do you need no, to- I, 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 it's, Sorry, carry it's on. It's multiple parts, sorry. And then it's, <laughs> do you need to post-process XG boost output to make the parent probability larger than the child probability? No, we don't, we don't train for each Go. It's actually much simpler than that. All, we, all our predictor does is to tell us whether with this distribution of scores, uh, we, we've got, uh, well, I, I guess it is saying for a particular go term and a particular distribution of scores, your like your probability of getting it, getting it right, if you like. And what was the, I can't remember what the second part was. Oh, the second one, yeah. Um, do you need to post-process the XG boost output to make the parent probability larger than the child probability? No, we, we don't. That's taken into account beforehand. Okay, great. Um, while we wait to see if a few more questions come in, uh, a quick announcement, actually. We're scheduled to have a, a coffee break at the hour at 3 p.m. Eastern. And what we're going to actually do during that time is try to revisit Damiano's um, CAF overview talk during the coffee break. So um, I invite all of you to stick around for the coffee break to, to see Damiano's talk since we weren't able to um, have it earlier due to technical difficulties. Can I, can I sit, have a quick plug for, for just to say for John Lees, because he's not here, just to say that because he started his group up a couple of years ago and is looking for students and I'm sure shortly postdocs as well. So I hope people will contact him if they're interested in, in what he's been doing. <laughs> 